Thank you. Um, I spoke last in uh, SSAT a few years ago in Birmingham, and uh, I was remembering uh, that, uh, that talk. Um, and in that talk, I was talking about changes that uh, need to be made to education and what kind of changes um, we might make. Well, uh, the good news is that we've now made some of those changes, at least experimentally. So this time around, um, instead of talking about uh, possibilities, I uh, decided that I would actually bring in two schools from the Northeast uh, who are experimenting with the new ways of learning um, that we uh, spoke about before. Um, before I do that, I just need to make uh, two points, really, uh, and, and then bring the children on. Well, first of all, of course, uh, my work is mostly about children's education. And uh, th this uh, messy word thing that you see here, uh, I keep revising it as we go along uh, from year to year. This is this year's. It's built from articles which are there on the internet. I just put them all together into a single document and then wordle it. And um, it's quite interesting to see what words float up. Um, and as you can see here, children learning internet groups uh, increasingly become bigger and bigger from as, as the years go by. <clears throat> Well, um, this is part of a, a longer talk, which I'm, I'm not going to do for this time around. But uh, the first point I wanted to make is about dematerialization. Now, I have a, uh, an artificially intelligent mouse um, at the back of the stage, uh, which will click the right link, as you can see. Uh, well, dematerialization. Um, you know, a, a number of things become obsolete, um, some that we can sense and some that we cannot sense. Uh, just to give you some examples, you'd be familiar with these examples, but just to uh, remember them, uh, you know, this, this used to be around and uh, it doesn't exist anymore, um, almost none. This one uh, I, I wonder if there, there are people actually still there with one of these in their pockets, but uh, n not for writing, but I think uh, more as a piece of jewel, uh, jewelry or, you know, as an ornament. Um, this, uh, you'd be surprised. I, I spoke to an American audience recently of uh, young Americans, and uh, somebody in the audience said, what is that picture? Okay, many people don't know what that is anymore. Uh, it's a slide rule. Uh, I used to know how to use it. I don't know now. And uh, it, I, uh, it was allowed uh, in an examination hall, actually. Uh, you could do multiplication and division with it and things like that. Um, this, of course, we quite fondly remember, I think. It disappeared, when did it? Uh, it disappeared about 10 years ago, I think and uh, first shrank uh, into little Walkman and that sort of thing, then smaller and smaller into MP3 players, and uh, then something really interesting happened, it disappeared. It disappeared into a cloud of zeros and ones, which you can access with almost anything that you want. This nice fond memory, again, it used to have a roll of plastic coated with silver salts on it, washed with acids and silver salts and so on and so forth, uh, is gone. This, every car used to have these, a uh, whole stack of them, they're all gone. But I want to take one example in relationship to learning, and it's uh, this one. Uh, this was the way people used to transport themselves uh, for almost the last thousand years or thousands of years, the horse-drawn carriage. Um, it had horses, it had the carriage, and it had a person who would drive the carriage, the, the coachman. The passenger would get into the back of the carriage, tell the coachman where to go, and uh, he would go there. Then, um, around 100 years ago or a little more, uh, the internal combustion engine got invented. 
and engineers said we can take out the horses. So, well, that's fine. Um, they've done their job and they can now go. We put in the internal combustion engine. But something happened that we didn't quite expect. The coachman went away. And the coachman went away because when the horses got replaced by the internal combustion engine, the passengers became the drivers. That wasn't part of the deal, but somehow the passengers became the drivers. And when passengers became drivers, lots of other things happened. Unlike trained coachmen, when passengers became drivers, they started driving over each other, in front of each other, uh, across each other, and so on. So a whole new system of licensing, of roads, of traffic lights, of policemen, everything had to be created. But we never went back to the horses. Um, the passenger-driven automobile continues to be one of the largest causes of death, but uh, it, of course, is uh, the most popular form of transportation. So if I look at this in the context of education, I thought, well, I could use this as an analogy for education. Would, would, we, have the, would we have a system where the passengers become the drivers? But the analogy actually didn't stop here, because from next year, something uh, even stranger is going to happen. Um, cars are going to start driving themselves. You know, the trials are on all over the world, including this country. Uh, the results are excellent. I've actually sat in one of them. It drives more or less like a 90-year-old um, with poor eyesight. <laughs> <laughs> but they're very safe. But when, when the cars become driverless, this time nobody loses their jobs, but something else happens. Driving as a concept disappears. You can imagine a generation growing up who will one day ask their grandfathers or grandparents, uh, what does driving mean? And then we will explain to them, oh, you see, there's a thing, there used to be a thing called a wheel and there was a stick that you had to move back and forth, and there were pedals that you had to pedal, and then the car would go, and that's called driving. And the child would obviously say, don't be silly. <laughs> okay. So uh, not just things, but concepts can also dematerialize. So could we have a passenger-driven education system and could that graduate one day to a system where children might ask their grandparents, what does knowing mean? It's strange to think, but it's worth thinking about. Well, the other point I want to make is about self-organized learning environments. So um, there you go, uh, a soul. A self-organized learning environment basically consists of computers, broadband, collaboration, and encouragement. You'll hear more about it from uh, children who actually practice it very shortly. Before I go to that, I just want to show you something else. This is what a soul actually looks like. You know, they're kind of a bit of a chaotic uh, environment. Uh, that video is from one of the first uh, that I uh, experimented with in uh, Gateshead. Um, the soul as an idea since that time has actually spread quite virally, and I've lost track of how many countries and how many teachers are using it. Uh, they, they number in tens of thousands, and they blog about self-organized learning environments. Uh, passengerless learning cars, uh, well, driverless learning cars, actually. Um, they're in practice across all five continents, and uh, 
the, the overriding question is, how will it fit into the system? So earlier on, we used to talk about, does it work? I don't think people talk about that anymore. They, what they talk about is, how do we fit it into the system? It also has effects on popular culture, like films. This one apparently got affected by the idea of self-organized learning. Uh, a Mexican school reported uh, going from the bottom of the heap to the top of the league tables using self-organized learning within one year. Um, our cricket captain, ex-cricket captain Mike Atherton wrote about new techniques in games and sports being invented using self-organized learning methods and so on. But what remains a challenge is assessment. How do we assess and how does the government want us to assess? Well, I'll uh, show you some, uh, an interesting picture. This is the picture of an uh, office 100 years ago. Okay, rows and rows of clerks and a floor supervisor. The clerks need to know how to read, write, and do arithmetic, and they're tested for the same. This is a picture of an examination hall uh, of the equivalent of GCSE in India. So if you just look at that, it becomes kind of obvious that we are preparing children for a generation of employers who don't exist anymore. So who do we prepare them for? Well, this is what an office looks like today. So is our assessment system preparing children to work in an office like that? I don't think so. So we need to change the assessment system to reflect the environment that the children will face when they go out of school. That assessment system has to look like this. I think and I've been saying this around the world, I think we need to make one change, an administrative change. If we allow the internet into the examination hall, the entire system will readjust. Somebody needs to take that decision. So with that, what I am going to do is that, um, oh, okay, let, let me show you one last bit before I call the children in. If you can just click on the school in the cloud, uh, last year, I um, got a prize, the TED Prize, and um, uh, with that money, what I decided to do was to build seven experimental facilities, uh, five of them in India and two uh, in the United Kingdom, in uh, northeastern uh, England, actually. Um, the idea was to, to see that if I take uh, a diverse socioeconomic uh, sp spectrum, starting from the remotest areas in India to middle-class India and to standard English schools. And if I set the same facility up everywhere, and if I study that over a three-year period, what will we see? Uh, the first of those years have gone, and uh, the construction actually has happened already. Uh, I'm going to skip that uh, and go on. Th this is Killingworth in England. George Stephenson uh, High School, uh, students of uh, which you'll meet just now. Um, more about George Stephenson here. There's an Xbox in there, um, and, and so on. Um, this is in India. This is Newton Aycliffe uh, in County Durham with a, uh, with a Skyped-in mediator on the wall, as you can see. Uh, an open air kind of uh, environment. It looks like a park with benches and, and computers scattered there. Um, this is Chandrakona in Bengal, uh, one of the remotest areas. And if we are lucky, in a short while, you'll uh, meet, perhaps not the children, because it's, it's too dark now there for the children to be there, but at least the coordinators and get to see a bit of that space. Um, so the seven schools in the cloud are all built. And what remains to be seen um, is uh, where the children will go uh, when they drive the vehicle themselves. So I'm going to now ask uh, uh, students from uh, George Stephenson to describe what does it take to build an environment within a regular school where self-organized learning can happen. Um, Come on in. Please just introduce yourselves and then. Hi, um, I'm James and this is Johnny and we're from George Stephenson High School. 
Um, so first of all, I'm going to talk to you about um, the layout of a soul room. So not all of the soul rooms are um, laid out exactly the same, obviously, but um, the R1 basically is designed for maximum group work, as are all of them, but in different ways. Um, so secondly, I'm going to say, how did we design the, car, um, the soul room? Um, basically, we, I remember to start off with, Sagata Mitra came in um, and we sat down at a table and listed a, um, a couple of things that we needed um, to include in the room. Uh, things like, we needed to make sure that it was, um, it didn't look like a classroom and make sure that, it, um, that it's, it's for group work and not individual. Um, so basically, at, there's six computers. So if you had, say, 25 children, you would automatically think, okay, we're going to give them 25 computers. But that would mean that they'd be working individually. And Seoul is based around group work, as I said. <laughs> Um, so there's only six computers and you fit around um, four to five um, students around each computer. Um, and basically that's, that, um, yeah, so it's, we've got um, an Xbox in there which is used for learning. Um, there's, we can research on all the computers. There's clouds that we can write on on the walls. And um, yes, that's about it. So our, the best point of the soul room is the group work ability. It's a great skill to have in today's job, job sectors. Um, as well as that, what makes it different to uh, any other classroom is the safety element. Students feel that they're safe and they learn a lot more while in that complex. Um, Um, there's, we, um, it, we've made sure that it does not look like an, an average classroom. So basically, if you were to blindfold someone, walk them into the soul room and unblindfold them, um, they wouldn't be able to tell that they were in a school. Um, the, it, it, um, I think Scott described it as um, a first-class uh, first um, airport lounge. It kind of looked a bit like that uh, earlier today. Um, and I don't know if you have anything to say about the layout. Um, so the layout, we've made bright colours, so students feel that it's a nice place to learn, and yeah, that's it, really. Thanks very much. I mean, you can't imagine what it feels like to, to hear that. Because uh, this is what I was saying uh, um, to the audience four or five years ago in Birmingham, uh, saying we have to build one. And there they are. Um, uh, so then, once you've got that environment, you heard the main things, uh, the main components. Computers with large screens, which everybody can see. Glass walls, so that anybody in the vicinity can see all activity inside uh, that space. Uh, enough computers so that you have four or five children to each, or four or five learners to each computer. That's very important, because uh, all my work, with my earlier experiment, the hole in the wall experiment, where I used to put computers in the wild, showed that children will make quick progress when they're in groups, much faster than if they're individually given a computer. Also a question which is often asked, could they go and learn something which is incorrect from the internet? Well, groups are self-correcting, and I have never seen them do that. But if an individual child is asked a question and uh, tries to find the answer on the internet, it is possible that he might come to a wrong conclusion. So we, we need the groups. And then the rest of it, as you heard, is you know, bright illumination. It should look really nice. Uh, I love that. Uh, description of if you, if you had a blindfold and were taken off the blindfold, you wouldn't know that you're in a school. Um, uh, so that's what we have. And the two that we have, one in George Stephenson High School and the other in Newton Highcliffe um, uh, in Greenfields, they look very different from each other, but both have all of these properties. So 
uh, so do the labs in India uh, with whom we'll, we'll connect. But so given that environment, what happens inside? So once again, rather than my telling you about it, I uh, would like to uh, call two students from uh, Greenfields uh, School in Newton Aycliffe to describe what happens inside their soul area. Hello, I'm Jazz and this is Millie, we're from Greenfield. So what makes a good question? A good question is something that it starts off with a question, but it develops more question and more answers to that question. For example, this morning we did a soul session to the teachers and we gave them the question, why is there so many different planets if nobody lives if, on them? If nobody lives there and they started off with science and then they went to religion and RE and it, it sprouted so many different questions, didn't it? It's a bit like the teachers swapping role with the child and the child is free to teach themselves from the re resources that they have in the room. And it's an amazing way of learning because it's individual. You're learning for yourself but in a group. And what makes it different from a normal classroom is the teacher will say, you've got this to do, this to do, this to do, then you're going to have a test on it. Whereas if you're in a souls room, you'll have a question, but you can go off in loads of different areas and you can pick how you want to learn. And it's basically what your best style of learning is. Um, the best soul session that I have done was my first ever soul session. It was, why is a teardrop shaped the way it is? And that was such a good soul session because it was curious and it made us curious. And that was two years ago and we still think about it now. So that's what, if you want to do a soul session, what your question has to be like. For me, a good soul session for me is a question that makes, as soon as I walk in the room, I'm like, oh, I wonder what the answer to that is. And even if someone doesn't learn as much in their group, when you have the discussion at the end, you will learn lots from it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's embarrassing. <laughs> So once, once again, very well said. Uh, the, the, the basic uh, tenet of a soul session is you drive the system uh, not with answers, but with questions. So the first uh, change in the job of a teacher is to uh, take the curricular material that you have and convert it into what many of them describe as a big question. How big can a big question be? How far can you go? <coughs> well, uh, in the seven schools in the cloud, we've tried similar questions right across, through from the remotest of the areas that we have to Greenfields and George Stevenson. And so far, to my great surprise, we've got similar answers. Uh, I don't know how. But uh, for a moment, uh, let's try and connect with uh, one of these schools in the remotest of the areas that we have, a, a village called Chandrakona in Bengal, India, where um, you know, uh, up, up until about half an hour ago, the children were still there. But the coordinator insisted that he needs to now send them home because it's getting dark in India. And uh, where the school in the cloud is, from there to their homes, there is uh, uh, there, there are no built-up roads, and he was worried about snakes on the way. No, so I, I couldn't really argue with him about that. <coughs> so, uh, but I requested if he can himself stay there, just for a few moments, for us to see uh, the place. Um, okay, can we try a connection, please? Hello. 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 Uh, I will uh, speak in English, but if you want, you can reply in Bengali. Uh, I am in the city of Manchester, 
in England. It's about uh, 6,000 miles from where you are. Um, it's quite cold. <laughs> Is it cold in Chandrakona? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's now uh, 22, 23 degrees Celsius. It's it's a freezing 22. <laughs> <laughs> we have um, over here. We have several hundred uh, school teachers and school principals. Oops! I hope that wasn't the wrong thing to say. <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, can you tell us uh, about what happens in your school in the cloud? Tomade uh, school in the cloud e ki hoy ek tu bolte parbe? Ekane bachara nijer moton kore kichu sabjekta kore. So, uh, the I mean, translate uh, uh, the, the children, uh, instead of uh, studying their subjects, research their subjects on the internet. This is the big difference that we have in this center. And uh, they also have uh, interaction with mediators over Skype. Skype koro to tumra? They interact with mediators uh, from the UK and from other countries over Skype. Bachara ki ingreji bolte pare? লেগেছে <laughs> কতদিন লেগেছে কতদিনেছে <laughs> And he says, uh, two months. Uh, that's not bad at all. Ekhane kono bachcha ase je English bolte par be ekto? Hi. 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 What's your name? My name is Kaushik Goswami. Kaushik Goswami. Okay. How old are you? How old are you? Eleven years old. Eleven years, okay, excellent. Uh, do you like your school in the cloud? Do you like your school in the cloud? What do you like about it? Ki bhalo lage? Ki 
So, uh, well, <coughs> he was a little hesitant. He said, uh, pictures and lots and lots of information. Those are the things that he likes about his school in the cloud. But uh, anyhow, I will tell you what I have done. What is your internet connection? How does your internet connection come? Okay, bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. That's uh, it's quite incredible, that connection, because uh, the last question I asked him was, how does he get the internet? Uh, they, they don't get a signal inside the facility. So what they've got are dongles connected to each computer with a seven feet long USB cable, which he then takes outside the window and uh, moves around until he gets a signal and then fixes that in position. That's the connection with which you were hearing this uh, Skype conversation. And uh, he sounded quite happy with it, actually. <laughs> so, it wasn't bad. But internet connection is a, a huge problem that we face um, uh, in some of these areas. Um, and there are a whole other host of technological problems. But uh, two months to spoken English, well, I mean, I, you, we couldn't ask for anything more than that, could we? Using nothing at all. I mean, just bits. So, uh, so there it is. That's where we are right now. In another two years, I'll know a little bit more about progress and uh, um, you know, rates of progress, examination results, impact on other subjects, and so on, from all of these uh, seven uh, schools in the cloud. Uh, people sometimes say, do you think this is the future? Well, I don't know. I mean, who, who can predict the future? But all I know is that uh, when a child says to a question like, what do you like about this facility? When a child says pictures and lots and lots of information, um, I don't think we really have a, a right not to give them that. You know? So I think for any school, it makes sense to consider a space where children drive their own cars. So I'll uh, leave it at that, and um, uh, thank you for listening. We have time for some questions. Uh, I think we have about uh, three or four minutes uh, for questions. If you have a question or a comment, um, uh, we could try to answer that. And uh, may I ask my friends to come, come back on stage, please? Any uh, any comments? Any questions? Yes, there's a hand up over there. Uh, how often do they sort of run in practice? How, how often are you sort of accessible for children? Um, uh, well, it varies from school to school. <clears throat> in the two English schools here, they're used for a. It's a good question. They're used for a slightly different purpose from what I use, it, uh, use them in India. In India, of course, their main use is the English language. Uh, not that they teach English, but they just converse. And one conversation of one hour every week seems to produce the results that you just saw of uh, spoken English within a, a couple of months. <coughs> Do you have an example of what you've used a granny for? When our solar room was first officially opened, we had one on um, there, uh, and we were doing a, um, I think it was a solar lesson for a primary school, actually, mm -hmm. um, that came in, and she was helping them there. 
Okay, so, so you know, in a school which is well equipped, like the English schools here, where you have enough teachers and so on, you can use the granny cloud as, a, uh, uh, as enhancing, as an enhancer, or a different experience for children. And of course, in remote areas where you cannot have access to teachers, you can actually uh, do a, a partial replacement of, uh, of the teacher's role. Uh, not teaching, but uh, guiding the learning process. Any uh, other question here? Yes, please. Have you tried connecting soul environments to each other? Uh, no. <laughs> Uh, the question was, have we tried to connect two soul environments to each other? Actually, we, the answer is yes, we have, but uh, not, in a, not in a controlled situation. I mean, I haven't actually studied that interaction, but we've connected schools in America and uh, England together. In fact, in George Stephenson, we've had a connection between an American school and uh, 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 George Stephenson, doing a soul uh, simultaneously, so to speak. And um, uh, the, the, uh, the most interesting of the examples is uh, one where a, a school in New Jersey in the US and a school in Ghana in uh, West Africa uh, did the same, uh, the same question. It was the question about blue whales and uh, came up with absolutely identical answers, although the standard of English was completely different. And um, uh, that's, I, I'll never forget that. So, so yes, you can connect them uh, and you get some really interesting uh, yeah, interesting results. We have maybe time for one more. Um, different teachers book. Um, one of the ones from some students saw him free, um, and it's uh, to, for us. It's open um, at lunch and break. But, well, I say it's open, it's just because um, me and Johnny are part of a, a, an extra curriculum uh, club at school, but yeah, it's um, the teacher's book when they want it. And what subjects have taken you? Um, we've had, how many? We've had oh, history, much. we've had sciences, I think it was, chem <coughs> well, no, it was last year, so it was general science. Art, I think. Um, art, DT. Uh, it's it's a range. I think the, it still works really well with all subjects. I think um, maths is a difficult one because there's always one set, uh, answer in maths, whereas soul is all about separate answers. <laughs> but um, the, 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 you can do math souls, but, um, but I think that's straying from the question. So yeah. Well, I think we're uh, just about out of time, and uh, as I promised, that we had a really different uh, configuration for the keynote. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, to me, it, it, it's, a, it's a brilliant moment of moving from, uh, you know, ancient wrecks like me to the future. Thank you very much.